so let me start by trying to sort of sketch the non-abelian Hodge modulized spaces. Um, so the simplest case is to start out by taking a, a smooth, compact algebraic curve, um, sigma a curve. Um, and then we want to attach to that, so let's fix, to start off with, with a, a, a connected complex reductive group G, and at a particular point we'd also want to fix a, a maximal torus as well. Um, so we'll fix those and attach to our curve H1 sigma G. Um, so there's various different ways to think about what this cohomology set is. Um, so in particular, you can take the Dirham perspective and look at, at pairs consisting, so pairs P nabla, um, consisting of a principal G bundle over our curve and a, an algebraic connection um, nabla on P. Um, let me just be quite imprecise to start off with. And then the Riemann-Hilbert correspondence gives an, isos, an isomorphism with the Betty picture. Um, so here we just look at the spaces of the space of representations of the fundamental group of our curve um, up to overall conjugation. Um, so we have these two different perspectives to start off with. Um, so in order to talk about modulized spaces rather than modulized stacks, you want to put in stability conditions. So first of all, people looked at this just in order to be able to construct spaces and not stacks. So people here would probably prefer to, to, to say that we have a, a analytic isomorphism of algebraic stacks here. Um, but if you do put in the, the condition that these are stable, um, then we have this you know, sort of um, perspective of Kobayashi Hitchin um, that the condition that these are stable means that it's possible to construct a solution to Hitchin's equation. So there's a slightly different perspective where I'll erase the one here and convert into a, a curly H and look at it instead as the space of solutions to Hitchin's um, solutions to Hitchin's equations. Um, so in particular, the space of solutions is a hyperkähler manifold. Um, so these different perspectives then become um, different algebraic structures on this, this underlying um, differentiable manifold. Um, so here, we would also need to put that these are stable as well. Um, so we have isomorphisms like that. So um, this is probably due to um, Donaldson and Corlett. And Corlett. And then there's this other complex structure, the Higgs perspective, M Dolbo, which is the space of Higgs pairs. So if you like, V Nabla where V is, again, a principal G bundle over our curve, and so phi, so phi is a Higgs field. Higgs field. Um, so if you don't look at the ones which are stable, the stack which is here is completely different to the stack of co connections. Um, this is much better behaved. Um, so once it's stable, there's the, the Kobayashi-Hitchin correspondence for Higgs pairs, um, that I guess was proved by Hitchin and Simpson, um, which gives the, this different complex structure on the space here, making it into a hyperkähler manifold. And so the isomorphism between the two here is called the non abelian Hodge um, correspondence. Um, non abelian Hodge. Okay, so we have these three different perspectives. Um, these are interesting to different people for different reasons. Um, so the main perspective I want to have a look at today is what happens if we ver vary the curve, then the spaces which are here and here fit into vibrations with natural flat connections, and we're interested in these, these connections. Um, so here it's, it's possible to integrate, and we get an action. Um, so the mapping class group 
of our curve acts on here by algebraic symplectic automorphisms and from this perspective there's an, a, a, an algebraic connection on this bundle of bases um, which could be called the non-abelian um, Gauss-Mannin connection. Um, Okay, so there's various extensions of this picture. Um, I guess I have to draw a line here somewhere. Um, so first of all, let me just point out there's this construction problem. Um, uh, so this says something like, does there exist a projective variety X such that the Dirac moduli space of X is not isomorphic to the Dirac moduli space of a curve for all curves sigma. Um, I think really it's best to have a look at, at irreducible comp components here, but um, as far as I understand, there aren't any examples um, of this. Uh, okay, so if we want to look for new bases, it's, it's best to look at um, non-compact curves here. Um, so the first picture is the tame picture. So here we fix our curve um, sigma and some mark points. Um, so I've got these points A1 up to AM. Um, so I fix this pair and then look at sigma O to be the open curve. And basically this amounts to looking at the spaces of representations of the fundamental group of the punctured curve. Um, these will be Poisson rather than symplectic, so we don't get things which are hypocalic to start off with. We need to fix slightly more data. Um, so this could be viewed as fixing the, the conjugacy classes of local monodromies around the punches. Um, so we need to fix um, a conjugacy class C in G to the M. So a, a conjugacy class for each of the punches. Um, this is still not quite the full perspective, um, so basically here, at each of the poles, we fix the, the, the real part of the eigenvalues and the imaginary part. So we actually want to have a, a quaternionic triple. So we need to fix a weight as well, um, which lives in... So at each pole, we want to choose a real code character. So I'll denote the algebra as G and T. So this is the real code characters, and we want to have one of those at each of the the poles, and this is the, the, the third in the triple that goes with the real and imaginary parts of the eigenvalues. Um, so when you look at it from that perspective, which I'll basically sweep under the carpet, we then need to look at the class in the centralizer in G to the M of the weight. So this is a centralizer in G M. So it's Pardon? It's a phi. It's a capital phi. No, it's a, it's a phi. Um, so phi is the symbol I use for the Betty weight. And so here we really want to look at, at filtered local systems that, that have the extra data of a, a reduction to a parabolic in a punctured disk around each pole. But um, let me sweep that under the carpet. And so basically here we want to look at connections which have first order poles. And in the Higgs picture, we want to look at Higgs fields which have first order poles as well. And it's possible to construct you know, hyperkähler metrics on the spaces which appear here. So the same type of picture appears and we then have an action of the mapping class group of the punctured curve. And so in particular for punctured spheres, we, we get actions of the, 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 the type A braid groups. Um, OK, but these aren't the most general solutions to Hitchin's equations which appear. It's possible to look at this wild picture as well, um, basically where we look at things that have higher order poles. So there's extra boundary data that has to be picked in order to get fi finite dimensional hypercalar spaces here. Um, so this extra data goes into the definition of an irregular... The, the curve, an irregular curve. Um, so basically, we, 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 
we need to fix at each pole um, so an element Q, which is in T. Okay, so if I choose a coordinate at the pole, it's in T of Z quotiented by T square bracket of Z. So it's just something like Q is some AI over Z to the, the power I, um, where, where these AIs are in the algebra of the torus T. Um, so the co coordinate independent perspective is to say that this is T of K um, quotiented by T of O, uh, T of O, um, but once I've picked a coordinate, it's quite explicit like this. Um, so then we can ch change the moduli problem that we have here and basically look at connections um, isomorphic to DQ plus something with first order poles at each um, at each A I. Um, so this part here determines the irregular type of the connection. So the, the tame picture that we, we looked at before was just the case to take Q, Q equals to zero. And so that becomes part of the extra data to pick at the start. Now, the strange fact is that Q behaves exactly like the moduli of the curve. And so that's why we define an irregular curve to be the smooth projective curve that we had before with the marked points together with this irregular type at each marked point. Um, and it turns out that, that you know, the deformations of these behave just like the de de um, deformations of the curve. Um, so this picture I've described here, we basically look at things like phi. Um, there's a factor of a half which appears dq plus log, um, and the rest of it be 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 behaves as before. The strangest part is perhaps what we put here. We have to look at the monodromy and the Stokes data as well. So let me just say that this is a wild character space, wild character variety, and perhaps I'll now try to explain um, more precisely what this is. Um, but it behaves just like the space of representations of the fundamental group that we, we have before. And then we're able to generalize what goes here because we could have a look at the, the de um, deformations of the irregular the, the types b before. Um, okay, so I'll now try to explain what this is and then talk about examples. Question. Yes. Is They're all conjugate, and so I can just pick one to start off with. This yeah. just has to be isomorphic to that. Oh, and so I can pick... The logarithmic, if I fiddled with the logarithmic bit, it would move all If I worked in a different one, it would still be isomorphic to that. So this is not quite the most general perspective. So in effect here, I'm saying that these connections can be straightened such that the principal part is in this Cartan subalgebra of the loop group, um, the loop algebra here. So it's possible to work with a twisted Cartan uh, here. And so um, uh, these are classified by conjugacy classes in the vial group of G. So one can do that as well. And for expository simplicity, I'm just talking about the untwisted case here. Um, OK, so I hope it's clear sort of what I want to do. Uh, so the weight then changes slightly differently, that the class here um, so here we went down from G to the M to the centralizer here. You need to look at the centralizer of phi and Q as well. Uh, so in effect, the Q reduces us to the centralizer of Q, and then the weight will reduce us further into a smaller sort of block the diagonal group. And the correct thing is to choose the class in there, which is to do with the re residue part here, which can always be fixed to be in the centralizer of Q. But let me try to ignore the technical parts of it. Um, okay. Uh, right. Uh, ah, so may, maybe I should state that this arrow here was first proved by Sabat in the wild picture, and the arrow here 
Um, I guess it's, it's Bickard and I um, at some point. Um, so maybe I'll just stop there. Uh, so what I want to define is, um, so right, we fix in the regular curve, sigma is this triple sigma AQ, um, an irregular curve. So we're basically now in the picture that we want to attach moduli spaces to this object here, um, maybe with a tr choice of conjugacy classes as well. Um, So at least let me try to make a precise statement. So we can look at the connections on sigma. Um, and this will be equivalent to the category of objects I'll call Stokes G local systems. Um, so there's versions with extensions and things. So but basically here I want to look at bundles, algebraic bundles on the open curve and a connection on P and this has to have the condition that we had before such that it's locally isomorphic to DQ plus the logarithmic ter terms at each pole. Um, so DQI at the ice pole. Um, so in particular this category of connections can be described in terms of local systems and so it's quite concrete. Um, so I'll define a connection on the irregular curve to be this. Uh, there are also versions that have sort of parahoric extensions across each of the poles, and that's really what the weights do, but let me just stick with this simplified version here. Um, so I want to define what the category of Stokes the, the Dokal systems are. Um, so at the end of the day, we'll be, 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 be able to look at these up to isomorphism, and then this will be a quite concrete space of um, space of Stokes representations of some, some group, group ways in our group G, quotiented by some group A. So at the end of the day, it is quite concrete, and so I'll explain this and then sort of sketch this isomorphism here. Um, Okay, I want to try to define um, a Stokes G local system. Um, so we have our curve, and then we do the real oriented blow up of it at each point to give a curve sigma hat. Um, and then we'll look at a certain open surface in there, and this will be called sigma tilde. Yeah, so I have a point here. Uh, and so, you know, I need to do this bigger. Uh, yeah. uh, right, <laughs> I'm a bit trapped in the board. <laughs> okay, so we have a, a curve here, and so we replace the point by the, the circle of the directions. And so I have, so a point here becomes a real direction pointing out of here. Um, so since I may have these four <coughs> directions there, and so will be these four directions here. Um, okay, so there's some technical bits I'll go quite quickly over. It's probably best to have a look in the, the paper. Um, so this is my sigma hat, and this has a ba boundary. The boundary of sigma hat um, is a collection of M circles, so i is from 1 to m of di, and di is just a circle. Um, so the fact is that this irregular type q that we picked at the mark point determines a certain amount of data attached to this circle. Um, and I'll just t t t tell you quickly what it is. It's, it's technical, but 
First of all, it gives me this centralizer group. It's just HI is the centralizer in G of QI, um, which is again a, a connected complex reductive group. Um, then slightly more tricky, it determines the singular directions, which is a finite subset of delta I. Um, so these are called the singular or the anti slope directions. Um, and then lastly, for each of these singular directions, there's a group, the Stokes group for all. So this is a unipotent subgroup of G normalized by HI. Um, so this is a subgroup of G, and this is for all D in, um, in A, which is the disjoint union of these AIs. Uh, so let me very quickly explain this, but... Yeah, this is the technical part that you sort of don't really want to do in public, but sort of have to. Um, so R contained in T star are the roots of G with respect to T, T, and so G is the sum of T plus the sum of the roots alpha in R of these one-dimensional root spaces G, G, um, G alpha, and we'll say that a root alpha supports... Um, a singular a direction D in DI um, if the function X alpha composed with QI has maximal decay has maximal decay um, as Z goes to this point AI along uh, DI. So this is a purely combinatorial definition just depending on the root I've picked and the the leading term of, of alpha composed with, with Q. And so the, the alpha component of Q is basically a, a meromorphic function germ, and it's possible to work out precisely what this means really explicitly. Um, so then the singular directions are just the set of D supported by some root, by some root alpha, uh, alpha. So this is a finite subset of di. And so then we can define the Stokes group. So if I have a singular direction d in ai, um, then, then there's a certain number of roots which support that direction. And we can just look at the product of the corresponding root groups. Um, so this is the group generated by x. Um, X of G alpha, such that alpha supports D. Uh, okay, so it's extremely explicit, but it, it's quite strange the first time to have a look at it. Nonetheless, we come back to the picture. We have some marked points on the boundary, and we have a group attached to each of the red dots. Um, so then to define these Stokes local systems, um, we'll draw a tubular neighborhood of the boundary here, and we'll call the bit inside there this, um, this, um, yeah, this is the ice halo HI, which is you know, isomorphic to an annulus. Um, and then what we do, for each singular direction, we do an extra puncture. So we puncture here. So if I have a direction D, I have this extra puncture E of D, and this defines an open surface inside sigma hat, and this is what we call our sigma tilde. Um, so we have a, a surface that has these holes and these extra punches um, like this. Okay. Uh, maybe I'll erase what I put here. Okay, so now we're in good shape to define what is a Stokes local system. Um, so we just look at the Stokes local system. Um, so I have a G local system on this curve sigma tilde, and I have a reduction, a flat reduction to, to HI in this halo HI. Uh, for each marked point AI. 
Um, so that's quite simple. And then we need to put in this extra condition, the Stokes condition, that if I choose a base point in the halo and I look at the local monogamy around one of these extra punches, um, then the local monogamy has to be in the, this Stokes group, Stokes DI. So we say local monogamies uh, are in, uh, so around E of D is in this special group, STO of D. Um, and it's then possible to prove that the category of connections on the curve is, is isomorphic to this category or equivalent to this category of Stokes G, the local system defined it in this way. To define the map between the two is quite complicated. You need to talk about multi-summation, um, but nonetheless, it, it ends up being quite um, concrete like this. Um, okay. Uh, so the consequence of this is that uh, so these things up to isomorphism, so connections on our curve up to isomorphism is isomorphic to HOM S pi G modulo H um, where pi is the fundamental groupoid of our curve sigma tilde so I cho choose one base point in each halo. Um, so I choose a point here and call it BI. And so we look at the fundamental groupoid with respect to these base points, uh, B1 up to BM. Uh, so we look at the homomorphisms from this group groupoid into this group G, and we quotient by the framings at the base po po points, which is just by the, this pr product, um, H1 up to H. M. Um, and then we need to restrict to the representations which obey this Stokes property here. Um, so we end up looking at the, the subset of all of the representations which obey this extra Stokes condition. Um, okay, so it's quite a, a concrete thing. Um, so now we can make some statements. Right, so I guess the theorem is that this thing HOM S pi G uh, is a, it's a smooth affine variety, smooth affine variety. Uh, yeah, uh, I can, but I'll have to erase extremely quickly if I do that. Uh, so is a smooth affine variety. Um, and the main point, it, it has the structure of a quasi-Hamiltonian H-space. The structure of quasi-Hamiltonian H-space. So I have an action of H and a multiplicative moment map, um, which is given by the local monogamies in the halos um, with the structure of, structure of quasi-Hamiltonian H-space. Um, so this is just a nice way to get directly that the, the variety associated to the H invariant functions has a natural algebraic Poisson structure. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll call this like the wild character variety attached to our curve, our irregular curve, and this is the wild character variety of sigma is an algebraic Poisson variety. Um, and the symplectic leaves um, are got by fixing these, these conjugacy classes of the local monogamies inside the halos. Um, symplectic leaves got by fixing, fixing local HI monogamies. 
with the monogamy inside the halo. So if we go back to the classical case with Q equal to zero, the tame picture, we just go back to the standard picture of having the representations um, with fixed conjugacy classes of local monogamy. Here we have to have these extra draw punches and we fix the monogamy inside the halos. Um, so in order to get something which is symplectic, we need to fix this C in H. Um, implies a syntactic thing, so M. So the wild character of a variety with these fixed classes, which is symplectic. The complex symplectic manifold. Um, and it's these which t turn out to have um, interesting hypercalar structures on them. Um, okay, so the basic aim is to try to understand what happens when we vary the curves. Um, so we want to define what the extension of that is in this case here. Um, so the main definition is to talk about admissible deformations. Admissible deformations um, of irregular curves. Um, so we want to generalize the picture where we have a curve with some mark points and we move the curve, but the curve stays smooth and the points do not coalesce. And so we have this family of curves over a base B and we want to say, when is this a, an admissible de de deformation? So we say that you know, the fibers, sigma B, stay smooth. Um, and the marked points do not coalesce, do not coalesce. And then the last condition is to do with what happens to the irregular the types, and the condition is that for each root and at each marked point, the pole order, so the pole order of the alpha component of QI, um, so this is a positive, to the integer, so z, um, this is constant. Um, so this introduces lots of hyperplanes in the space of def, um, in the space of all possible de deformations of Q, um, and it's this that gives rise to interesting braiding with respect to the, um, the, the Qs. Um, so let me give some examples that the main statement is that as you might hope, um, so if sigma over B an admissible deformation of an irregular curve, um, if I have an admissible de deformation of an irregular curve, I can then look at the family of wild character spaces over the, the base B, um, then the wild character varieties of the curves um, form a local system of varieties. And it preserves the Poisson structure as well, of Poisson varieties. So ba basically I have a non-linear non fiber bundle um, with a, a flat poisson erisman connection on it. Um, and this implies that I have an action of the fundamental group of the base um, acting um, on any of our fibers. So the wild, so if you like, you know, the wild, you know, we can also call this MB of the irregular curve sigma B. So acting on the wild Betty space of the fibers. Um, so now we should look at the, you know, the, the moduli stack of all admissible deformations of a fixed irregular curve. And this would say that the fundamental group of that is acting on there. But it's easier to, to, to talk, uh, you know, just have a look at individual, um, just have a look at individual families of um, deformations and not discuss how to fit those together. Um, so nonetheless, we have this, which is perhaps the main statement. Um,
right. We have an action here by algebraic Poisson maps. Mm. The connection is like a, a, a field of horizontal vectors. Right, an F and the Poisson structure is a field of vertical bivectors. Right. And is it enough to ask the same Gaussian commute, or that's not enough? I mean, what happens is that you can choose a local covering of the base and actually choose a trivialization and check that the clutching maps are Poisson algebraic or some, um, I, I Morphisms, and um, at least in the in the Betty picture here. Um, let me talk about examples. Um, so this is kind of an incredibly classical subject. Uh, so I think the first it, it, it example should be to look at the case of G equals C, C star. Um, so we have c curves and we have these extra times. Um, uh, and so t taking G to be C star means that the Qs are just sort of lists of numbers. Uh, so this fits in with the theory of Baker functions. Um, so basically, you look at something like X um, you know, T1 W plus T2 W squared plus dot 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 and ba Baker said that if you fix something like this on an algebraic curve in a local coordinate W which has a pole at the marked point then there's a uniquely determined function you know, which has this be behaviour at the point and um, perhaps ju just poles elsewhere um, so then I guess it was Critchiver who said, well, if we differentiate this with respect to, to these times, and so the, this part here is my Q of Z, where Z is 1 over W. Um, Critchiver said if you differentiate this with respect to the times, um, we get a solution to KDV or KP or something. Um, so the times which occur in KP through the work of Critchiver and others um, match up precisely with the, the admissible deformations of an irregular curve for the group C star. Um, so there's various different ways to understand it that the Critchiver construction is a fourier mackay transformation, but one can also just say, well, Baker constructed some functions, you differentiate them, and they are solutions to KP. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, So the second example is to do with semi-simple Frobenius manifolds. Manifolds. Um, in particular through the work of Dubrovin. Uh, so these, it basically gives you a way to classify sort of two-dimensional topological quantum field theories through sort of non-abelian Hodge theory. The, the basically Dubrovin's work says that if I have a Frobenius structure, I can look at the, the quantum differential equation, which is a certain connection on a bundle over P1 having a p p pole of order 2 and a pole of order 1. Um, this is a point um, of some irregular Betty space where the curve is a P1 with a pole of order 2 and a pole of order d d 1. And the map from here basically classifies the structure that you had to start off with. Um, and one should perhaps compare this with the way that sort of abelian Hodge theory um, classifies K3 surfaces or something like that. Um, there's also an extension of this, which is this TT star story, which is also this NC Hodge um, or Terp picture. Um, so in particular, it was looked at by Chicotti and Baffa, and they do the same type of thing where you end up with a curve having two poles order two, and the structure which is here is classified by the, the, the Stokes data which appears there. Um, so I was interested in this a while ago and it sort of suggests that we ought to think harder about po poles of order 2. And so let me uh, describe the next example. Um, 
show sort of quantum groups, or the classical geometric picture for quantum groups, and we get the um, sort of geometric origins of sort of Lustig symmetries or Lustig Seubelmann, uh, uh, Kirillov, Rescher, Pekin um, symmetries. So the point is, there's a modular theoretic approach to quantum groups, which is perhaps not so well known. So you start out here with the dual of the algebra, so the functions on there are just sim g, and you can quantize th this by taking the PBW quantization, so we quantize here, um, and we end up with u of g, and then there's a global version, or a, if you like a group version here, um, so there's a non-linear Poisson manifold such that the Poisson structure at the identity is isomorphic to the linear Poisson structure here, uh, G star, and then you kind of do the push out of this to get the quantum group here, um, UQ of G. So this has an integral structure such that this at Q equals to one specializes to this Poisson structure here, um, and this is more normally viewed as a deformation here. Um, so we should re really view this as being the multiplicative version, and this is the quantization here um, of this sort of glo global Poisson manifold. Um, so basically this can be viewed as the fiber of a family of Poisson manifolds, um, so we just look very explicit. We look at sort of a over z squared plus b over z dz. So we look at the set of these where a is in t reg and b is in g, which is isomorphic to g star. So this is a vibration over t reg just projecting onto a. Um, and so here we can take this to be our base of our sort of admissible deformations of an irregular curve, where we just take Q to be like minus A over Z. Um, so here we have an e example, and if we describe it in the Betty picture, we, we end up with a vibration whose fiber is isomorphic to this, and we therefore end up with an action of the fundamental group of T reg, the braid group on G star. So we do sort of T reg, we have this M Betty family, M B sigma, family over here, and the point is that the, the fiber, if you look at connections which locally look like this, the, the fiber is isomorphic to this, which as a space, it's just uh, T semi-direct product U plus cross U minus, so the unipotent radicals of a pair of opposite Borels. And so, so the Poisson structure, which appears here from the quantum group perspective, matches up with this sort of gauge theoretic Poisson structure here, and we can look at the monodromy of this connection here, and that matches up with the quasi-classical version of the, the quantum vial group symmetries on the quantum group. Uh, okay, so we have sort of a better sort of geometric or moduli theoretic understanding of what happens there. Uh, okay. Yes? So... So A over Z squared plus B over Z. Yeah. Um, so it's possible to write down here precisely what the non-linear connection is. And you get some differential equation like DB. So how should B vary with respect to the time such that you have an isomenogamy de deformation here and you get this second sort of non-linear equation as A inverse bracketed of DB and a, uh, D, A, and B. So you have this, this quadratic sort of non linear equation. That's the explicit di differential equation for the sections of this non linear connection here. Uh, uh, so there's kind of a fourth example which I should mention but that I don't understand completely, but maybe people here understand it better and can explain to me exactly how it, it works. Um, so let me put this in brackets. Uh, example four. Uh, okay, so you're supposed to want to take G to be the simplex of automorphisms of a, a, a torus, so C star C 
to the 2n. Um, and then you can rephrase what you mean by isomenogamies to this as a wall crossing formula, um, which at the end of the day means that a certain product of things has to stay constant, which is just the definition of irregular isomenogamy, but you would like to also, also apply it in this situation here. Um, and it was observed by various people, I guess, Kinsevich and Soivan and Joyce and people, that um, th this is the way that DT and variants behave. Um, so, so DT in the variants um, uh, behave in this way. Um, and then there's various workers, people like Gayote, Moore, and Nitsky, who say that it's possible to use these invariants to directly construct the twister space of these wild Hitchin hypercala man manifolds that we constructed at the start. Uh, I don't think that's been proved, but it's a nice idea. Uh, so use this to construct the twister space um, of this Hitchin space of an irregular curve um, explicitly. Okay. Um, so I wanted to try to talk about some more recent examples. Um, uh, uh, so in particular, I mean, the, my understanding is that Joyce sort of looked to, to this and converted the, the wall-crossing picture there into something which is continuous and then discovered this equa equation here as being the continuous version of the... the um, wall crossing which appeared and then Bridgeland and people pointed out that the, his equation matched up with the equ equation which is here. Um, okay. Right, so the basic aim was that we wanted to try to understand all of the non-linear connections which occur geometrically. And we have looked at particular examples and have this big picture, but we don't know whether or not we have them all or exactly which ones we did, 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 um, do have. So, for instance, you can try to look at the examples where dimension of M is equal to 2. So these are certain hypercalar 4 manifolds. Um, so there's a list which appears, um, and there's a good way to try to understand them. So all of, well, yeah, th these basically occur just in the case where the genus of the curve is equal to zero. Um, and in that case, it's good to try to understand them by looking at an open sub subset M star um, where we restrict to looking at bundles which are holomorphically trivial on the global P1. Um, so we restrict to the open part where the you know, so like P is holomorphically trivial over P1. And then it turns out it's possible to recognize the spaces which appear. And so that helps us to understand what the um, full spaces are. So, so there's a list um, which basically has 11 entries um, labeled by certain affine bio groups. And so here we get E8. E7, E6, uh, D4, uh, D3, which is equal to A3, A2, A1, A0, E2, D1, D0. Um, so basically all of these are irregular and these have representatives which are tame. Um, so I'm just kind of sketching the, the picture. So the point is that, that if you look at the ones which are here, then they have an open part uh, such that this M star is isomorphic to the corresponding ALE space that was constructed by Kronheimer. Um, so isomorphic as a complex symplectic manifold. The metric is different. Um, manifold. And so we know these are parameterized um, 
So these are basically resolutions of C2 modulo a finite subgroup of SU2, and you then deform, and the groups which occur match up with the groups which are the looked at here. So in certain cases, the ALE spaces have this partial compactification, which have a, a more transcendental metric. Um, these are slightly different. These fit in with this ALF picture. Um, so here you get the Atiyah Hitchens space, and here Evan Star. This is the Atiyah Hitchens space. This is the deformations of the double cover of the Atiyah Hitchens space that were looked at by Dancer. <coughs> Um, and this is basically, you look at the cotangent bundle SL2C, and you do the hypercalar quotient on both sides by the circle S1. Um, I guess this is due to Kronheimer as well, because he looked at the hypercalar metric here. Um, so in certain cases, we have these sort of well-known spaces such that um, we can attach the full picture we talked about at the start to those Bases. Now, Kronheimer constructed these for an arbitrary ADE um, affine dinking um, graph. Uh, but here we just could get you know, a um, certain number of them. Um, so the basic question is what happens in higher dimensions? Um, is it possible to attach the whole picture at the start to certain graphs which go beyond the affine Dinkin graphs which occur here. And so maybe I'll just uh, state it as a question and then sketch an answer. Um, okay, so it's a question. Um, so here we, so, so these spaces can now be viewed as sort of Nakajima Quiver varieties for an affine Dinkin graph. I mean, that's precisely how Kronheimer constructed them. Um, this has been looked at in higher dimensions for arbitrary graphs. So, which of the special graphs, such that it's possible to attach our whole picture, and in particular the the isomenotary connections to? Um, so, so, which graphs of gamma are such that the Nakajima quiver variety of the graph um, is isomorphic to M star um, for some open part of our space M Diram within the regular the curve? Um, so this would mean that it's possible to parameterize the whole of the picture at the start in terms of graphs rather than having to speak about irregular curves. Um, and in particular, it's possible to understand isomorphisms between the spaces in terms of the vial group of the graph. Um, so the graph determines the caps moody cartan matrix, and we can look at the, the vial group of that, and that actually acts to give isomorphisms between them. Um, that's the first question, and then the second question is like, um, can we describe um, the full Betty's basin? So we have here MB, so this is isomorphic to M Diram by this irregular Riemann Hilbert, and that has this open part. So suppose we have um, an M star, which is isomorphic to a Nakajima quiver space, N Q B of a graph, um, can we actually read the Betty data off, off of data on the graph? This is you know, supposed to be a better way to try to understand what the Stokes data is as being maps along edges of a graph um, rather than these, these strange triangular matrices which appear. Um, so let me sort of at least mention it, an answer. Um, it may not be the complete answer, but we do have a large class of graphs such that this does work, and I'll just state it and, and then stop. Um, so it does work for um, what I call supernova graphs. Um, 
So you basically take a complete K partite graph, um, complete K partite graph, for an arbitrary K, and then you glue on some legs. Um, so for instance, the complete K partite graphs are attached to partitions into K parts. So suppose I you know, fix a partition, something like 2, 1, 1 of 4, then the rule is that I'm supposed to attach edges between any nodes which are in different parts. Um, so if I do that, I would get this, which is isomorphic to a square. Um, yes, I would. Thank you. So I would get a square with a line for it. Um, so if I did instead this one, 2, 2, um, then I would get the, the square. Um, and this matches up with the fact that here we get affine A3 whose Dinkin graph is a square. Um, so the reason we don't get affine A4 here, which would be the pentagon, is that the pentagon is not a complete k partite graph. So we get, for instance, A3, which is the triangle here, which is the graph corresponding to the partition 1, 1, 1. Um, so the question is, you know, what is the class of graphs which extends these such that I can attach higher dimensional spaces to them. It's the complete k partite graphs. And also it's possible to join on a leg um, to each node here. So you, you can get things that look like, like this. And so in particular, if you took, say, E8, um, then you could take the complete bipartite graph like this and then glue on some legs here to get affine E8. Uh, wherever it is, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Uh, uh, and then it turns out it's possible to read the Stokes data off of the, the graphs as well. Um, maybe I'll stop there. Uh, out of time. <laughs>